by research development to optimize high power system swap. My co-author on this presentation is my teammate, Dr. Adranto Ogni. And I'd like to address the title here first. Um, while this presentation is particularly about Cyrister switch development for high voltage combined with high current requirements, the long view development of silicon carbide power semiconductors is not just about size, weight, and power. Integrating semiconductor switches into high power systems enables finer electronic control of the turn on and turn off of prime and load power, as well as greater repeatability and reliability for power modulation. In finding the balance between designing for specialized use or for wide adaptability, optimizing semiconductor characteristics at the chip level opens up the door to a wide range of switching applications using modular switch configurations. Um, Darren and I both came to the Army Research Laboratory out of undergraduate. We are electronics engineers there. I was technically mentored by longtime experts in experimentation and analysis of power electronics and pulse power component research. And Darren completed his PhD with in-depth analysis of power device behavior and built up device modeling capability for high voltage silicon carbide when the commercial tools were really still geared more towards silicon behavior. We've conducted cooperative research with Dr. Stephen Bain's group at Texas Tech University for several years. So you may have seen some of their papers published on related silicon carbide research. And you can reach Darren and I at our email addresses listed here on the title slide. Moving to the second slide for the outline. Um, The presentation is going to include information on why we've been researching power devices and silicon carbide in particular, um, then technical challenges and our approach for tackling them, description of the thyristors we're working with, and what our characterization and analysis is showing us. On slide three, I get in broadly into the research motivation. While our research is in support of systems and platforms to achieve the Army's modernization goals for overmatched multi-domain operation, we're working at the foundational level. Here, our team generates a deeper understanding of novel research components and research possibilities, as well as characterization of commercial devices beyond the realm of the data sheet and the manufacturer's capabilities. More broadly, ARL's power device and packaging research not only innovates new solutions for the Army, but has impacted material processing procedures of our commercial partners, modernized standards for silicon carbide testing, and reshaped the approach to package design for novel devices. On the fourth slide, I get a little more into the research motivation for silicon carbide in particular. In the years since the Army Research Laboratory, and additional DOD and DOD entities began funding silicon carbide material and device development here on US soil. Silicon carbide MOSFET field effect transistors have made it to the shelves and into many automotive, automotive communication and power conversion systems, replacing silicon insulated gate bipolar transistors or IWTs, especially in the 1200 volt to 6500 volt range. Much of the silicon carbide research you hear about currently is how to tune the controls and gating in contrast to silicon controls to optimize high-speed performance and capability of the silicon carbide. Device design research continues, pushing for high operating efficiency in devices designed for 900 volts and lower, as well as 10,000 volts and higher. My teammate put together this graph a couple of years ago, so it is slightly dated but it conveys the distinction between the commercial product realm on the, on the left, uh, where, where the bulk of the published research lies, kind of in the center white space there, and where ARL silicon carbide programs were pushing material processing and device design the past 10 years in the blue space to the right. ARL's push was to explore the fabrication limits of achieving high voltage blocking and high current density at the chip level. The other thing that this chart shows is what types of switches are intended and capable of operating in different voltage and current ranges. So you see data points for silicon carbide MOSFETs 
which are the red squares, below 15,000 volts and individual chips below 100 amps. This is the range where the MOSFET's on-state losses are acceptable and the high switching frequency of the MOSFET can be taken advantage of. You see data points for silicon carbide IGBTs in the blue diamond kind of data point um, above 12,000 volts and below 100 amps. IGBT is the leading type of switch for efficient, moderate frequency modulated switching at those kinds of voltage levels. Then you see thyristors and GTOs, so known as gate turnoff thyristors, stretching the current range across the top portion of the graph. While well, ARL has expertise in all of these devices, this talk is centered on thyristor characterization and analysis. Moving ahead to slide five, continuing on the reason we're looking at silicon carbide to begin with, um, listed here are the benefits that silicon carbide material brings to the table for high voltage and high current switching. These characteristics have supported pushing the limits of device voltage and current density for broad defense applications and particularly pulse applications, which lie beyond the commercial product focus range. In particular, um, for thyristor devices, I'll highlight the low R on resistance, um, where the devices we have been working with with Wolf Speed fall in the 10 to 20 milli ohm range um, for one centimeter squared devices. And I'll also point out the higher saturated drift velocity, which supports high DIDT and DVDT capabilities, um, which is approximately in the range of 8 times 10 to the 6 centimeters per second. On slide 6, I get into some of the technical challenges we have faced over the course of our silicon carbide program. There have been a lot of challenges, both in device design and characterization, over the course of ARL silicon carbide programs. Um, there were many steps and many years not shown here between the first 3,000 volt 0.16 centimeter squared silicon carbide thyristor and the present 15,000 volt 1 centimeter squared thyristor. Um, and many aspects of layout and material processing did not easily scale with each increase in voltage blocking and chip area. The drive to increase voltage blocking is to minimize the number of series stack devices in a high voltage switch so to reduce size and to simplify controls. Increasing chip area along the way yields a better ratio of central conducting area to edge termination, which appears as black around the edges of the device images at the top here. The edge termination design also had to be refined with increasing voltage in order to neutralize greater electric field over the narrow edge termination, but also reliably and repeatably and cost-effectively be manufacturable. Our team specializes in rising to meet the device characterization challenges by creating tools and techniques that enable us to study both transient and long-term steady state behavior. We then combine theory, modeling, and experimental measurements to gain deeper understanding of device characteristics and better optimize design, packaging, and controls. And I think that that balance between Specialization versus all purpose comes into play here for both design and characterization. In designing experiments, we want to extract as much information as possible about device behavior under different conditions. But we need to always be efficient in our process and mindful of specific army interest applications that the device may operate within. On slide seven. I over outline our approach. Um, I highlighted a few words here that are core to the approach. We have largely used cooperative agreement grants and no cost research and development agreements or CRADA to leverage expertise from the commercial and university arenas to advance silicon carbide innovations for both defense and public purpose. And I'll expand on this three part approach over the next couple of charts. On slide eight, 
I list our current ARL high voltage device program partners, Free Wolf Speed, um, SUNY Poly up in New York, and Genesic down here in the Washington, D.C. area. These are our current high voltage device development partners who responded to a broad area announcement and were funded from congressional funding specifically to advance U.S. silicon carbide fabrication capabilities. Not shown here are several commercial and university partners we also have who are focused on propelling power device packaging to higher voltage, higher temperature, and higher frequency. Um, in bold text are the devices that each team is seeking to improve and broaden access to. And even on this short list here, you'll notice that there is more interest and more expertise in MOSFETs and IGBTs for high voltage and moderate to high frequency continuous switching. ARL has been one of the few organizations looking at thyristors for high current needs that are traditionally met by thyrotrons, spark apps, or large area lower voltage silicon controlled rectifiers. All the silicon carbide thyristors described in this presentation were designed and fabricated by Wolfspeed, which is Cree's power and RF company. Um, and the devices that I'm presenting here were from the last lot of our previous contract, um, whereas we are looking forward to kind of the next iteration of this design coming up soon on the current program. Moving on to slide nine, um, describing ARL's characterization capabilities. In order to fully characterize and analyze device behavior at extreme electrical stresses, ARL has built up several high power evaluation capabilities and techniques with a few of the higher voltage and higher current test beds listed here. We've created device models in-house, um, with some examples shown on the bottom there, and also in partnership with Texas Tech University. And Texas Tech also aids us with analyzing long-term switching reliability and failure modes of device, devices and packaging as shown on the lower right-hand side there. Slide 10 moves into our experimental focus. Um, key switching parameters that we want to characterize and analyze for pulse power switching include transient behaviors and high current densities, and especially transient high current densities. Using theory and modeling to analyze experimental results helps us understand how transient operation may vary over what we consider to be large chip areas and will help us to optimize design for high current and fast switching. And shown on the upper right here, you can see a couple of our baseline packages um, created both in-house and at wolf speed, not part of our uh, novel future packaging program, but just uh, kind of quick and easy baseline packages to get us devices to work with and characterize. On slide 11, I highlight just a couple of the possible applications out there. Um, high voltage combined with high current and relatively fast switching are relevant to many defense systems as well as industrial applications, particularly for mobile land and air platforms, reducing size, weight, and maintenance of switching components is key to enabling new capabilities. Um, so these are a couple of example applications from the literature replacing traditional thyrotons and reducing stages of a high voltage marks. Um, they're both tens of thousands of volts, hundreds of hertz, hundreds to thousands of amps in application. Replacing a thyrotron with a semiconductor switch has been shown to increase system operation time and reduce maintenance. High voltage IWTs have been demonstrated in mark circuits to reduce volume and weight and controls um, and possibly using thyristors in a marks could increase the power output via higher current capability. Um, in the industrial world, there is interest in thyristors for generating plasma shock waves. Um, and also thyristors have been shown by NC State um, in hybrid DC circuit breakers. Moving on to slide 12. 
I get into some of the details for the thyristor and pin for pulsed high current. Um, listed on the top here are a few of the characteristics that make these devices unique. Um, and to get here, our partners at Wolf Speed um, had to develop a lot of fabrication techniques and capabilities. Our cooperative research with Wolf Speed has culminated in 15 kV one centimeter squared thyristors and complementary pin diodes. Shown here on the left is the cross section of the pin diode followed by the cross section of the N-dope thyristor, which is the first of its kind, and then to the right, the P-dope thyristor. The thyristors are asymmetric, meaning they are only built to block high voltage in one direction. So the pin diodes are often used to clamp reverse voltages and recirculate reverse currents. These enabling fabrication techniques listed here um, that will speed use were based on ARL's previous experimental analysis and modeling of earlier device generations. The P-doped epithyristor on the right was fabricated first, followed by the first of its kind, n doped thyristor. The N-thyristor is also grown on an N-substrate, as shown in deep blue at the bottom of the P-thyristor there. But the substrate is subsequently ground off of the N-thyristor, resulting in a four-layer PN, PN structure um, looking from the, the bottom to the top. That is more similar to how a silicon thyristor is structured. Utilizing the n doped epi allows Wolfsby to specialize in one type of epi for all of their high voltage devices, including the pin and the IGBT, and also places the gate junction adjacent to the cathode or low potential side of the device. The thyristors have a fine cell base layout maximize switching control over the full device area. The cross-section cutaways shown here use kind of a cell view to convey the different layers of the thyristor. You may notice that the N-thyristor is the exact reverse of the P-thyristor in terms of P and N doping. Um, and just using this scheme got us our first ever N-type thyristor, but the next iteration on the current program being fabricated now has more fine tuning of the doping and of the gate layer thickness to improve turn on gain. On slide 13, um, I get into the end of epi design and expectations. This chart presents our initial high voltage blocking and turn on measurements for the end dope thyristor. Leakage current is very low at 15 kV, shown on the left there which was further verified when we received devices at ARL where we could do long-term DC voltage blocking. The forward voltage, or VF, shown here is a little higher than we would like, particularly if you look at that 100 amp data point and extrapolate the slope out to thousands of amps. Thick and doped epi more easily achieves higher carrier lifetime values than P-doped silicon carbide which should lead to lower on state voltage and to greater lateral current spreading velocity, which would ensure the full device area is in conduction at the time current begins to flow through. Also shown here, again, is the baseline test package from Wolf Speed that utilizes wire bonds and high temperature dielectric potting. On slide 14, our evaluation circuit is shown as a simple capacitor discharged into a resistive load with adjustable inductance. It was originally designed to compare the turn-on delay and DIDT capabilities of thyristors that had different epi thickness and different chip area. Um, apologies for the change in naming scheme here that I labeled the thyristor SDCO on this chart. Um, I presented some of those, the earlier comparison work at the IEEE Wideband Gap Power Device Conference a couple of years ago. I then ended up removing the pin diode shown, which changed the shape of the current pulse enough to enable me to do some kilohertz rate switching, which I published in Directed Energy Symposium Proceedings. Um, the capacitor used in this circuit is only 14 nanofarads. So while it generates high instantaneous power, it is a fairly low energy circuit. Um, and the load resistor is 4.4 ohm. Um,
on slide 15, getting into the turn on delay and DIDT. The thyristor depicted in the cross section on the left there um, shown is the P-doped epitype, but conveys the general equivalent circuit of the thyristor as two transistors with the base width of each transistor, as well as the charge diffusion rates, current density, and device dimensions, all contributing to turn on delay and spreading velocity within the device. If you look at the equations, you'll see that to reduce the turn on delay, you need to increase the diffusion rate um, and increase, you can increase the spread velocity by increasing the carrier lifetime. There's a little bit of a balance there um, where if you increase the carrier lifetime too much, you'll have trouble achieving your high voltage blocking in the off state. Um, so a bit of a delicate balance to try to get the best performance. Continuing to slide 16, the reasons for studying these parameters and switching the thyristor under these conditions are to design the best control circuit for the device and understand how performance compares across different designs and different types of devices. Part of the insight may be determining at what repetition rate and current level a thyristor makes sense over an IWT. With a thyristor, I'm seeking the, the limit for how much current I can thrust through the device in a short time differential. When that limit is reached, we see the thyristor entering saturation uh, pointed out on the chart here and increasing the available energy from the capacitor no longer results in a linear increase in current at the load. Um, so basically this is, this is the limit for how much current I could push through that particular device in that amount of time. Um, and the example shown here happens to be um, a 10 kV P thyristor. On slide 17 um, shows where we considered how our gate current affects the turn on delay. So prior to pulsing all the devices, we looked at the effect of the gate current's rising slope. Um, the actual amplitude of the gate currents shown here in the left plot is not super important. It's more about the, the rising edge of the slope um, that's going to help our device turn on. And if you look at the time scales uh, the, on the right plot, the current is basically already flowing at that time. Um, maximum gate drive DIDT that we applied with our driver was 400 amps per microsecond. And the waveforms here, again, are for P thyristor, but these tests were repeated with the N thyristor. The higher gate DIDT spreads the charge beyond the gate electrode and creates a more homogeneous distribution across the active area of the device by affecting the diffusion rate. We found that the earliest turn on delay for these devices was 75 nanoseconds from the time the gate current was initiated. Um, also kind of rolled into these plots here is a little bit of the driver circuit delay. Um, but, but once the driver started conducting, it was 75 nanoseconds from the time the thyristor conducted. So now that we had an idea of the parameters affecting turn on in DIDT, we gathered some information on all of our P-dip thyristors and we were able to look at how much our first ever N-dope thyristor bought us for fast switching conditions on slide 18. I have a direct comparison between the n doped and p doped thyristor designs switched in the same circuit at an initial charge of 9.8 kV on the capacitor. For each plot, time on the x-axis is marked at 100 nanoseconds per division. The left y-axis depicts falling voltage across the thyristor at 2,000 volts per division, and the right y-axis depicts pulse current at 200 amps per division. Time was spent um, throughout this process calibrating the inherent delays in the Rogowski coil that we used to measure current and cleaning up some of the noise in the captured data. If I plotted uh, these two voltage waveforms on top of each other, both the N and the P type, you would see that the voltage across the N thyristor falls nearly twice the rate of the P thyristor. That voltage falling on the N thyristor is about 150 kV per microsecond versus 85 kV per microsecond for the P type. So this means that the effective on resistance of the N thyristor 
is falling more rapidly than uh, the on resistance of the PCI register. So we are attributing this to faster lateral current spread across the full area of the NSI register, which is what we expected from the carrier lifetime and the design. It's likely that at the time high pulse current begins to flow through the PCI register, conduction is actually only occurring through a fraction of the device area, resulting in higher effective resistance. And I would love to find a way to image this for empirical evidence. Um, and we have had discussions in the past about imaging the turn on of thyristors, but we do not currently have that capability. The current through the end thyristor peaks about 50 nanoseconds sooner, reaches a 10% higher peak, and significantly faster DIDT if you look at the values listed in the captions there. Um, I think carrying out this work a bit further, it would be possible to reduce the inductance of the circuit to push the anti resistor to higher DIDT as saturation was not reached during this testing. Um, so the, the limit of the anti resistor was not reached, but we were able to get this direct comparison between the two different designs. Um, if you look in the literature, you can find published data for higher DIDT with silicon anti resistor chips, but they are lower voltage chips, um, more like 1200 volt or 4000 volt devices. The best I've seen for pulse rep rate for silicon thyristors is a couple of kilohertz. Because this is single pulse testing with the power dissipated in a short time scale, there's not an opportunity for a temperature rise within the device. I've done some similar burst switching at a thousand pulse per rate second, but we would want to do some basic simulations on burst rate or continuous switching to understand what type of cooling might be required in those conditions or what kind of burst profile you could switch without cooling. On slide 19, um, we look at the power, instantaneous power at the load for the two previously shown waveforms. So on the same plot here, looking at the pulse power delivered to the load resistor when switching each thyristor under the same condition, you can see that significantly more power is transmitted to the load more quickly using the NSI resistor. Again, the voltage applied at the load rises about twice as fast, um, which you know helps get this result. And still reducing the circuit inductance and optimizing the on resistance to the NSI resistor in the future may create more separation here. Um, but looking at this, um, in case the NSI resistor looks like the ultimate solution, I also wanted to include a different switching condition to show where there is more room for improvement. On the next slide, slide 20, um, there is another direct comparison between the N-doped and P-doped thyristors at a much wider pulse. Um, if you note, the x-axis is shown in 200 microsecond divisions. The voltage on the y-axis is zoomed in to see the voltage drop across each device, which is about 20 volts at these current levels. So pretty good, pretty low on resistance. At this time scale, we assume each thyristor's lateral current has had plenty of opportunity to spread over the one centimeter squared device area. The circuit is designed to deliver a slow rising current spread over a longer period of time. Heating generated within the device can affect performance at this time scale. And the few milliohm difference in on resistance means that we cannot switch as much current or I squared T through the end resistor before it approaches thermal runaway. So what is shown here is the maximum current I could switch through the end thyristor before thermal runaway, whereas the P-dip thyristor, which has a lower on-state conduction losses, is able to be pushed to higher current. Um, we would like to get the end thyristor's on resistance closer to that of the P design in order to optimize performance over this whole range of switching all the way from the nanosecond to the millisecond timescales. On slide 21, I summarize the key takeaways from these last few charts. For that, for rapid low energy discharge of the narrow pulse, the end dope thyristor has lower switching loss, peaks faster, and transmits more instantaneous power to load. At a higher energy application, um, which the wider pulse shown was about 400 joules, the P-dope thyristor had lower conduction losses, enabling us to reach higher current density. 
Um, really, both of these dot designs could use further optimization to increase lateral current spread at turn on and reduce overall on resistance. Um, but moving forward, uh, Wolf Speed is going to stay focused on the P dope thyristor. On slide 22, I have some of our pass forward. Um, over the course of ARL's past cooperative agreement with Wolf Speed, the OMIC contact process and high voltage termination were already optimized to ensure reliable long term high power operation. Um, so we're, we're happy with those designs there. But on the current program, we need to refine the M-thyristor design further to satisfy the maximum application space for pulse switching. Um, it, as I mentioned, it is possible to further reduce the inductance of the circuit and push a little more on the limitations of that M-thyristor. Um, in the meantime, we have also identified some limitations to our baseline test package for high current and high DIDT, which are more relevant to these thyristor and pin devices um, than the IGBT and MOSFET switching. Outside of what has been presented here, our team is researching the realistic high frequency continuous switching limits of commercial power devices, looking at the space in between the device qualifications that inform the data sheet ratings and the few brief megahertz timescale demonstrations in the literature. We're also exploring how machine learning can be used to optimize designs and controls and to sense end of life performance in circuit. On slide 23, uh, I list relevant publications related to what was presented here. Um, and this presentation was instigated by a poster I presented at the most recent Directed Energy Professional Society Science and Technology Symposium. Um, and if you're interested in locating any additional publications from our team at IRL or from Texas Tech or Wolf Speed, um, you can contact Darren or I, again, at the emails listed on the title slide. Um, in closing, I would like to say that, um, you know, there is significantly more silicon carbide research out there and development in MOSFETs and IGBTs. But there is a desire for thyristors, particularly in pulse switching, high current density, and high DIDT. The applications are a bit more specialized, but I find that there's always a couple of industrial or defense folks who check in with me on thyristor progress when I'm out at conferences and interagency meetings. Um, these devices, again, are the low loss, kind of like high conduction thyristor design. They're not intended for your high frequency oscillators or picosecond timescale switching, they're, they're not capable of that. Um, but they're more intended and useful for low duty and single shot high current and high DIDT. We don't have any further funding right now for silicon carbide device development, but I, we don't want to lose the expertise that has been developed, um, especially when there are limited players there out in the commercial world. Um, so we want Wolf Speed to know that there is active interest out there. So certainly if if anybody listening has um, interest in thyristors, you know, feel free to convey that back to us at ARL or to the crew at Wolf Speed so they kind of get a better understanding of the marketplace. And please contact me if you think thyristors may work for your different application. And I can tell you based on characterizations we've done, um, if we have any advice to give or if there's anything we can look out for you. Because um, certainly there's, there's much more baseline characterization work we've done that was not included here um, that may inform some of your work. Um, and I think that about wraps it up for me. Thank you, Heather. That was great. I appreciate the, the, the very careful delivery of this presentation. And um, uh, if there are any questions, um, we'll have two ways that people can ask them. You can either, if you're in the DCS system, you can type them in um, and I'll read them off to Heather just in that chat box there. Um, or if you're simply dialed in and you, or, or you'd like to just sort of speak it out loud, we'll go ahead and leave some time for that as well. So um, I'll take a moment to pause, um, see if there's any questions that someone wants to throw out and we'll see if we can go from there.
Okay, Heather, we just got a question that came in from chat. It said, um, what silicon carbide uh, polytype 4H, 6H, are the Cree slash wolf speed substrates? Uh, yep, these are 4H off-axis substrates. Okay, uh, another question here. It says, uh, what, what was the key challenge with creating an N-type uh, thyristor over a P-type? So, in um, growing the devices, the an N-based N-dope substrate is always used instead of a P-substrate um, because the P-substrate would have much higher on resistance. Um, so, if you look at the P thyristor, it began on an N substrate and building up from bottom to top, you get an NP, NP um, doping pattern. In order to grow the N type thyristor, they still used an N type substrate, but then you end up with a kind of an extra doping layer in there. So they had to grind off the substrate in order to result in a PN, PN structure. Um, so Wolf speed put a lot of time and investment into figuring out how to do wafer grinding for their commercial MOSFET products in order to reduce resistance through the thickness of the devices. Um, so kind of their their commercial learning there, they were able to apply over to our R&D thyristors and figure out how they could get rid of that end substrate um, and create a nice finish on the backside there. Um, so next, que next question that came in here are all it says uh, all substrates from Cree slash Wolf Speed are a minimum of 100 meter, millimeter diameter. You had, did you see any issues with yield? Did you process the whole wafer? Um, so I don't have specific yield numbers. Uh, we we originally pushed for we were trying to push to larger area chips, um, but then again as we as we progress to uh, thicker epis and higher voltage devices, um, you know, designs don't just scale. So we had to backtrack a little bit. So we stuck with one centimeter squared devices um, and out of a one centimeter squared pattern on a, a six inch wafer, um, I don't know the exact yield off of there. They basically do some binning before they send us devices. Um, so everything we're working with in-house, they've done preliminary probing on um, and then we go ahead and do more of the long-term DC blocking and the high current conduction. Uh, any questions from the audio side of things for those, those folks who maybe can't, can't type up their, their question in the chat, feel free to just sort of shout it on out. I have a question. This is Carl Hobart yep. from Naval Research Lab. Hi, other. Um, Hi, how are you? You said good. You said that um, with your lifetime enhancement, that if you enhance the lifetime too much, that it led to uh, worse blocking or higher leakage. I didn't quite understand that. Um, so the the doping that we have on the um drift layer right now is somewhere on the order of below 2 times 10 to the 14 per centimeter cubed. Um, and then the lifetime enhancement that WolfSpeed has used has gotten them up to as high as, I guess, 20 microseconds. Um, so, so that hasn't caused any problems um, with any leakage for us. That's just... Um, you know, in general, if we, we want to maintain blocking, we want to balance out that that higher lifetime and the treatment process of the EPI. Okay, thanks.
Okay, uh, question here in the chat. Uh, when testing the devices, did you test the bear wafer or did you package them? If so, what type of packaging? Um, so these devices are all packaged and if you um, scroll through, let's see, maybe slide 13 or back a little earlier on slide 10, I show some of the packaging, which is Cree's kind of like baseline package. Um, it's a, the outer packaging is a peak material for high voltage isolation and the devices are wire bonded um, with aluminum wire bonds. So that's not really the ideal for high current density or high temperature operation to be using aluminum wire bonds on a gold surface device. Um, and especially if we're, we're trying to spread current rapidly across that full area of the device. I think going forward, we'd like to experiment more with um, kind of more of a press pack structure, but scaling that down to the chip area to try to um, make good contact with that entire high current surface area. Okay. Um, any other questions? Again, if you have a question on the audio, just go ahead and shout it out. Otherwise, we'll, I'll read them off here from the chat. We'll just maybe take uh, maybe one or maybe two more questions if we have any. And if we don't, that's okay too. Well, this um, this recording or this uh, presentation has been recorded, and, and we'll be sure to uh, process it and publish it out. Um, so if you want to review it later, it's out there. Um, Heather did mention her email is on the, the title slide of this, so these slides can be downloaded. You can feel free to contact her if you have any other questions. Um, if you do have any any, any questions on, on a related topic um, and you wanted to kind of test out our the DSIAC or HDIAC technical inquiry service, research service. You could uh, funnel some questions to us and, and we might reach out to folks like Heather to get some uh, responses depending on the topic. Um, but uh, with that, I guess we'll, we'll close out. Heather, thank you so much for taking the time and, and putting this presentation together and walking through it with us. And um, just thank you for this, this time and the presentation. Yes, again, thank you for the invitation and for everybody who tuned in. Hope everyone's doing well, thanks. All right, thank you. All right, take care, bye-bye.